Hello, my name's Davo, and I'm here with Rory of Rory Story Cubes. The the Rory. Well, we established this before, but welcome. Hi. Thank you. I'm back again. You're back again. Where, where have you been? Where have you been all this time? You've been sat here talking with me. I know. And we're going to talk some more because I have all these Rory Story Cubes in front of me. Mm -hmm. And for, for people at home that don't know, this is the core box of Rory Story Cubes. But what is Rory Story Cubes? It's a really simple storytelling game um, that contains nine dice, uh, mm -hmm. each with a unique set of pictures on each side. The objective of the game is you roll the cubes and you make up a story that begins with once upon a time, and you have to join together all nine face-up images. That's very nicely done. That's very, very simple. I'm, I'm very practiced. Sweet. Yeah, very, very practiced. <laughs> Many years. I can imagine. I can imagine. Now, these are, it has your name on, how does it feel to have your name on the box? There's kind of a story behind that. Okay. Um, so when we started with the game, it was actually called something different. It was called Metacubes. Okay. Um, and actually someone, a colleague, suggested calling them, like, she was like, you have to put your name mm. on it. And I fought against it because I'm Irish and I'm kind of humble. It's like, you don't stick your head above the parapet. Um, so I was like, I can't do that. And I was listening to a podcast like way back about kind of like entrepreneurship and like naming products. Mm. And in the podcast, they said, well, if you're not willing to put your name on a product, then how can other people buy into that product? Mm. And I was like, dag now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to do it. And yeah, it's funny because like in Scotland, it's actually gone down really well because, mm. you know, Rory is a, a boy's name and so it appeals to a lot of boys who and it has helped to get them into storytelling mm. where they would have uh, maybe thought it didn't appeal to them. But by seeing the name on the box, they're like, oh, that kind of you know, like, appeals to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you actually get started with Rory's Story Cubes? Like, how, how did you come up with the idea? So back in 2004, I was actually a creativity trainer where I'd work one-on-one -on -one with people. What's a creativity trainer? Can you train creativity? How do you do this? You can exercise it. OK. Um, so I had learned like a lot of tools and techniques that mm. would help and kind of like step-by-step -step processes that you can follow. And I used to work with both individuals and with like teams and companies to help them kind of be more creative in their problem solving. OK, gotcha. Um, so really focused for me on using creativity to solve problems. Mm. Um, and as part of that, I had learned uh, an invention technique by uh, Dr. Wynne Wenger, who has written some incredible work on like creativity and creative problem solving. And one of them was this visualization exercise. Mm. So in my mind's eye, I went on this journey where, long story short, I encountered these children who presented me with this Rubik's Cube with pictures yeah. on it. And they said, this is the thing you're looking for. Um, and I, at the end of the exercise, I sketched down what I saw. I ran out and I um, bought a Rubik's Cube. Um, and kind of with my partner, Anita, we sat in a cafe and we sketched out images, stuck them onto the cube, and literally started using it and seeing how effective it was. Mm. Um, so back in the early days, we used to hand make these and sell them to people before transitioning to dice. So did you draw every single cube? Yes. Did you think this? Did you think this through? No, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's a lot of not, cubes, Rory. Not when you start to look at the full oh range. Goodness. It was like, oh my god, what have I got myself <laughs> into? And especially when we like set out that we were going to um, end up with essentially nine sets of nine cubes by yeah. the end of the the journey. There was years like going, what have I, <laughs> what have I done? Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Uh, so but it's also out of necessity that yeah. um, you know I have a background in kind of art and design, and so. Being able to draw the icons was kind of my skill level and, and ability of, um, like, they look simple, but they require, I think of it like carpentry um, mm. or sculpting, where you have to actually craft out the icons out of this very small space and also um, bearing in mind the manufacturing process because we met with the factory and we mm. saw the physical constraints that came with the mold and how they made them. Um, so it, they look simple, but there's an amount huge amount of work that goes into refining those icons and making each one kind of uh, a piece of art in itself. And how, how do you refine it? Well, I mean, what makes the cut and what doesn't? Um, well, like a key uh, kind of determiner for us is, um, first of all, does it fit the theme of the set that we're creating? Then can that icon have multiple uses and be interpreted in multiple ways? Mm. So in the original set, we have an apple. Um, and the apple can be used for like having eating an apple. It can be used for fruit in general. It could be used for an orchard, or people might use it for like 
visiting the doctor and the recommendation of an apple a day keeps the yeah. doctor away. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we always look at can that icon be used for more than one thing and also even can we orient it differently on the, the cube? So by rotating them, does it have different meaning? Mm. So in the in Voyages as well, there's a character that I designed as a kind of like a highwayman. He's got mm. like a mask over his mouth. So he's in here. Mm -hmm. Well, if let's he's, if he's in here, let's go find him. Um, so a highway, highwayman with a mask. Yes. OK. Oh, I think I saw. Uh, I was in there. Uh, hang on. Da, da, da. I always say I should know where they all are by <laughs> now. Um, this, with it, you know, you always can get a random assortment, aren't you? Which one is it? Uh, it's funny looking. It's a race. Uh, I don't think, don't he's, think he's on that one. I bet you it's the one in your hand. Uh, no. No. Pro. Where is he? Oh, this one. OK. Ah, so, oh, let me go show that one. Oh. Let me go show that one to yeah. you guys so you can see it at home. So if you hold it the way you have it, he looks like a kind of a, a kind of a thief or a bandit. And then if you rotate it 90, or 180 degrees, yeah, keep going there. He suddenly looks like a bandito or, oh, yeah. you know, with a mustache. And some people see it as a fish as well. A fish? Yeah. Oh. With the kind of little tail at the end. OK. Yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. Yeah. You can literally interpret them however you want. There's no right and wrong. And I'm, I'm constantly amazed when people point to it and say, oh, this is definitely X. And I'm like, mm. Mm. I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't like, say anything. Okay. Go, That's really interesting. What's, what's the weirdest one of those that you've got? There's one in, um, again, the first set, there's like a kind of a tower block building. Mm. And people described it as like a couple in bed with a weird duvet, um, like with a polka dot duvet. A couple in bed with a weird polka dot duvet. Yeah, this one here. Oh, my hand. I want to pick this up. Oh, Rory, <laughs> your cubes are everywhere. OK. So you really have to stretch your imagination here. So they're in a long bed. Um, with a, a duvet pulled up over them. Do you, do you know what? I can actually kind of see it. So that's the headboard on top. There's the kind of polka dot duvet. And you can just see the two heads of the little people to sitting on top. There we go. Oh, my goodness. That, yeah. like, that takes a huge leap. But I kind of go, like, what made you think that? But also, like, <laughs> power to you. Yeah, to I know. Up with that. It's also called the square owl. The square owl? Yeah. So owl. take a look again. Square out. Oh, because oh, of its eyes, you think? So those two dots are the eyes. The, the flat top are, is like the kind of the brow of the owl. And then the dots there are like the feathers. What? Like you, you, you couldn't have even imagined that when you were sat <laughs> no. there drawing those up. No. And I, like, I love those kind of happy accidents that happen when yeah. you're designing things. So speaking of, speaking of like, the actual images, can you tell us any secrets about them? Maybe ones that didn't make the cut or ones that have changed significantly since you started so doing them? So again, let me just dig through voyages. Um, I have a kind of a, like a top secret method um, that I use for kind of finally selecting the icons. Oh, um, top secret. It, well, I'll just say it uses a lot of intuition. So because okay. there's so many patterns in here, you can't like mathematically figure out what's the best optimal combination. So a lot of it is kind of gut instinct. And I do these kind of checks with myself to kind of go, is this the best combination of icons? And when I was working on Voyages, mm. the kind of feedback was like, no, there's something that needs to change. Mm. And my sense told me that my daughter, who was maybe like six at the time, um, she would know what the answer was. And I showed her um, an icon that had like a kind of pixie fairy type character on it. And I said, this needs to change. What do you think it might be? And she pointed essentially to this drawing that was on my sketch pad. Okay. And she said, that needs to go on to the mm. set. And I was like, OK. And my kind of gut was telling me, yeah, that's the right one. Um, and it's been really fascinating because this has been used to like teleport people, make them disappear. They've exploded. Um, they've had inspiration, like the idea of popping into their head. Yeah. yeah. So again, the, the icon really met my kind of uh, measurement of providing a huge amount of value within a very simple design. Yeah, well, it's, it's got back to interpretation, isn't it? You can mm. interpret it as whatever you want. And I think that's what's so special about it. And so many of these yeah. things, like the, like the tower block. 
about yeah. the square owl. I mean, that's that's inventive. Yes. Right there. I'm impressed. Kudos to whoever invented <laughs> yeah. the square owl. Uh, so how many of these, when you have your, your notebook and you sketch up the icons, how many of them do you do? Um, so, I mean, the process, the way I, I would work is initially I would sit down and say, okay, what's the theme of the set that I want to create? And I, and I do this exercise that was developed by Wynn Wenger, again, um, of I would write for 20 minutes nonstop, so I have to keep writing, I'm not allowed to stop, about like what are all the elements you would want to have in that kind of story? So if it was like voyages of epic adventure, or if it was kind of powers, superhero themed, what would be the kind of stories? And then I go back and make notes of those things, and then I think, can I convey that as an icon? Mm. So then I start sketching out, you know, I try to reach at least 54, you know, minimum icons, mm. but usually it's 60 or 70, and I filter them down to like little doodles, and I stick them onto dice as quickly as I can and start trying to make stories with them to see what works or not. Um, so I have like pages and pages of icons that um, go through different drafts as I'm trying to refine the design before I even go to like Illustrator, which is where I would go to, to draw the icons. And it must be quite tricky because the dice are only like so big, aren't they? Like to actually, you can't fit a huge amount of detail, so you have to be very clever. Yeah, so it's a kind of, when I'm working on it, it feels more like I'm being a sculptor that I've been given this like little area to work in and I have to like literally chip away, nudge, you know, uh, a line left or right, yeah. a, a millimeter or two. Um, whilst also thinking about the factory and how the cubes are made, because we visited the factory and we got to see the process that was being used. And like literally the side that they push the cubes out of is you can have a different line there than you can have on the side that is kind of free and open when, when the mold opens out. Okay. So it's like, okay, so I can have more detail on this icon than I can mm. have on this one. So we actually kind of also work with the factory and reposition the icons to make them easier during manufacturing as well. That's crazy. So like on one side, it's got to be more simple than it has on the other Yeah, side. there's a level of detail that they can't really get. Mm. Um, so generally, I'm very specific about like which die um, an icon appears on because mm. I'm thinking of the interactions between all the different sets. But with on that die, they can be on any face. So that's where we work with the factory to kind of get the best placement for the mm. icons. So you, let's jump back a bit. So you mm. said you were a creativity trainer, yes. which I'm all about. I mean, I, I've heard the title, mm. I don't know much more about it. But is that how you got into game design? But you fell through it when you were doing that Rubik's Cube? Had you dabbled with games before at all? Um, I had kind of grown up playing games. And my big, my brother, who's 10 years older than me, was a, a war gamer. And I think I was a guinea pig sometimes for him to have someone to kind of play with. Yeah. Or more likely, he had to babysit me. So I have early memories of like looking over a table, you know, at these Napoleonic <laughs> figures. <Let me> play. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was never like a huge part of my life. Play was always a big part of my life. Mm. Um, always playing with action figures and things like that. Um, and then got into Games Workshop, um, mostly the board games. Um, okay. And not, not, the, not the actual minis? No, um, I think just the time it took to paint them. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed the, the board game side of things. And then I kind of got out of it a bit. Um, and it was really with inventing, like coming up with Roy Story Cubes, which was a creative thinking tool at the time in my head. Mm. So I wasn't even a game designer when I came up with Roy Story Cubes. You, and it, just Rory. Yeah. yeah. And it was just the way people kept playing with Roy Story Cubes. I, I realized we had something that was bigger than just a creative thinking tool. Mm. Um, and it kind of became a mission to kind of bring it out to the, the world. So myself and Anita formed the company, the Creativity Hub. And we spent, you know, looking back now, 15 years we've been working on Rory Story Cubes. Oh and how have you transitioned from Rory Story Cubes to a new project? Because what's, what's your ethos? What, what's, you know, what is it that you want to spread? Um, well, it's really like with the games that we make now, um, we want games that have heart is at the core of them. And so we want get to create games that either get people together talking around the table, that allows people to bring something of themselves out. Um, so with games like um, Blank, you're kind of inventing new rules and you're contributing to the play experience. Or a game like Holding On, The Troubled Life of Billy Care, which is about caring for a dying man. Um, it's about the kind of poignancy and reflecting on your life almost as you, you play as well. So it, it's a game where it leaves you thinking after you've 
played it. And that, for me, if we can make games that, you know, either get people together, get them to express themselves, like Rory Story Cubes, or gets them kind of reflecting after they've played it, I think we've kind of added something valuable to the world. Well, I'm completely on the same same page. Because I've been asking like, all the people I've bumped into, like, how do you think board games change the world? Mm. And I think that's, for, for me, that's part of what it is. It's making something that's so provoking that actually just gets people and gets people thinking. And I, th I think we haven't even really scratched the surface in terms of people playing board games at the moment, because there's a very, you know, definite um, kind of category of person that plays, and it's slowly spreading. But there's a huge audience, because I'm always talking to, like, people when I'm traveling, and um, they just don't think of board games beyond Monopoly and, and Scrabble. And yet we know there's wonderful games out there that to be played. And I'm kind of, you know, almost looking forward to like 10, 20 years time where they've just become even more mainstream. And that'll be partly through the topics of the games and the themes mm. of the games that we create will become so varied that they will appeal to a wider audience as well. Well, you, you're, you're getting there now because you've been telling me about some of the different ways that, I'm running upside down, yeah. some of the different <laughs> ways that Story Cubes has been used. And it hasn't, it's, people don't just use it, you know, as a, as, as a game to no. play, do they? they? They do all kinds of different things. It's been used um, for, I've used it um, also with people with kind of brain damage for re um, rehabilitation, for language learning, um, for kind of like drama and art therapy, as well as a tool like an icebreaker is a great thing. Um, and one of the kind of recent things that I've seen is people who work in like agile development, um, so that kind of fast turnaround. Uh, during their meetings, their scrum meetings, um, not the rugby kind. So we went through this beforehand, <laughs> and I was like, but they're going to get the dice all day, and they're in a scrum. Yeah, yeah not that kind. Um, they use that as part of their weekly reviews. Yeah, but, yeah. And again, it's because of the power of metaphor. Um, we live in a world that's, I think, quite logical, you know, and focuses on the logical, and what Rory Story gives is kind of invites you to play with metaphor mm -hmm. as well. I think that's quite powerful and people see its value in many different areas as well. Um, what's the most unusual, what's the most, yeah, what's the most unusual way that people have used Rory Story Cubes that you've heard of? Well, so this isn't the most unusual, but it's, mm. for me, it's the most touching okay. kind of experience. And one day, you know, I was flicking through the Amazon reviews because everyone does it, even if they deny it. Um, and I came across a review of a man who was saying his father had had a stroke and it was in the US mm. and his medical cover had kind of expired. So he had to bring his father home and take care of him. And he, in his review, he was saying he was using Rory Story Cubes to help with his father's language development. And I just, you know, I, I teared up. I was like, if I've made this game here in like Belfast in, in Northern Ireland, and it was having this kind of impact on someone's life, you know, across the Atlantic. Um, it kind of gave me a kind of, kicking the behind and said, right, you have to keep doing this. Um, yeah. If if the game has the potential to have that impact with someone, we, we have to keep going. For, for sure. And that, that's, the, that's the kind of impact that you've taken with you to your next games as well. We try. So you've, what, 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 what are we working on next? So we've had Rory Story mm. Cubes. You were saying you've now branched off and you want to explore new ideas. Yes, um, but our kind of parting gift for Rory Story Cubes is a game called Untold Adventures Await. Okay, and what's, what's it, that? So in Untold, you become the heroes in your own kind of 60-minute um, episodic adventure. So it's a cooperative game where the Rory Story Cubes actually become like the games master in the game. So they're used to generate the story. And then you get to make choices, see what happens as part of the choices. And you have all the highs and lows of a good TV show. Like So you have the opening where the danger mm -hmm. um, arises. Then you have like the plot twist. You have the journey that the, the characters go on, mm. you have the big reveal, and then the final showdown at the end. It all plays in 60 minutes, doesn't require any kind of like, you know, games master. So it's great for families who are interested in things like Dungeons and Dragons, but, you know, it's a bit intimidating with the books and the rules. Uh, they can jump straight in with this. Or for anyone who is a big role playing fan, it's a great way for them to introduce the idea of role playing to people in a very friendly way. Because we designed it so it looks like a board game when you're playing it. but you're actually going on an adventure. It, oh, it's tricksy. Yes. You trick them into, into role playing. Well, the thing is, with when you combine it with Rory's Story Cubes, it becomes this really open system. So you can go on adventures in your favorite kind of like TV universe. So if you want it to be like, oh, clever. you know, yeah. your characters in Harry Potter, you could do that. Or if it's going to be in Star Wars, um, 
but also it might be like you know Doctor Who, or it could be a Victorian drama that you you could do that as well, mm. or it could be. You know, one of the weirdest ones was like an 80s cartoon setting where the players okay. said anything goes mm. within this if you think it could appear in an 80s uh, cartoon. And did you play in that one? When what did go, no? So what, they were what did well. They would just like you know encounter gi giant space heads and fly in their spaceship, and they'd have like you know okay. space unicorns as part of that whole kind of weirdness that would happen. But it was a world of their create creation, and they played like series within it. So they would have like multiple episodes taking place in this world that they had created. That's so clever. And I think that's really a testament to the icons. Like you, because of the mm. icons, you created them in such a way that this could be a cave mm. or it could, be, it could be a wig. I mean, it, honestly, yeah. it could be whatever you want it to be. And because you've left them so loose, you can inject like all of this different imagination and, into it. And that's kind of a big challenge with, again, deciding what icons go where is like always giving players the space to bring their own imagination to it and to realize, again, that you know, they're maybe more creative than they think when they're playing with it. Mm. I have another question for you. Okay. So if you could have made any game, what would it be? So is that, I'll rephrase, because that could be a tricksy question. Yeah. What's a game that you, that you wish, that, what's a game that you think, I wish I'd done that? The kind of game that I admire the intent behind is um, the, the kind of precursor to Monopoly, which is called The Landlord's Game. Okay. And it was designed by Elizabeth McGee in about the tw early 20s, 1920s. Mm. And she actually designed it as a kind of, almost like a cautionary tale. <clears throat> she designed it as a cautionary tale about kind of land ownership and property own ownership. Um, and it's kind of ironic that it, it was twisted a little bit in terms of like almost a celebration of um, capitalism. Mm. But the idea that she looked at a game as a way of like informing people in an interesting, you know, where again it became a sandbox where people got to be something that they aren't normally within that game mm. and, and see the repercussions of it. I think um, I'd like to have been kind of part of that experience in the 1920s. You kind of are part of that experience now, aren't you? You're, 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 you're having, you're giving people tools and watching them put their own meaning into it and you're giving them the sandbox. Yeah, and I, I mean, I hope kind of in years to come that people report back. Um, you know, we, we get messages from people where they've written books inspired by it, it's helped scripts, it was, I'm told it kind of helped writer's block with an issue of Spider-Man. I can't, what? I don't know which one exactly, yeah. So, wait, 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 wait. Peter Parker has played Horror Story Cubes. <laughs> Uh, that's, is that, is that, that stretching it a little? The, the hand that moves Peter Parker <laughs> <laughs> played very straight games. I like, I like the, the, the little technically. Yeah. You're like, mm, we can't <laughs> yeah. say that. Um, no, but yeah, I think that's the kind of um, what's really exciting is seeing what other what it inspires other people to create. Mm. And I think is a really fun part of Rory, being part of Rory Story Cubes. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much. So just to recap, we've been playing. So should I call, just call them your story cubes? <laughs> yeah, I go, uh, they're my story cubes. No, they're Rory's story cubes. So this is another question, last question. Do you call them Rory's story cubes or do you call them story cubes or just my story no, cubes? No, I insist on calling them Rory's story cubes. Okay. So when other people call them Rory's story, or story cubes, I, when I'm talking about them, I'll always say Rory's story cubes. Do you, do you refer to yourself in the third person? I was going to say, it's, like the, ro it's like the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> Rory isn't happy with this. <laughs> like, Rory, you're right here. <laughs> I wish. Please stop. Please make that a thing. Just for you, I will. <laughs> well, it's been Rory's story cubes with Rory. Yeah. Uh, if you guys like it, please do check them out. Uh, you can find them all over, so give it a Google. Otherwise, there's app, an app available. Oh, my. <laughs> My dungarees has fallen down, Rory. They would like slip down over the course of the Did video. They? It's, it's, ooh, it's very <laughs> risky. Well, we'll see you guys soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.